Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, lovely people. This is Marie Alessi with the lovely Jennifer Tracy for our absolute final interview for the year of 2022. And what an incredible year it's been. It's been such an intense year for me. I have to say it was a very beautiful and positive year. And I had the honor to watch you, Jennifer, on LinkedIn, like all the things that you do, the things that you share, the stories that you share touched me so deeply. And you were one of those people that I've chased for the longest to <laughs> beg you to come here. And I'm so honored that you did because you just told me in a quick preview um, that you don't do this very often. So I feel even more honored that you said yes to come here. So thank you so much for being here. And would you do us the honor to introduce yourself to our audience, please? Welcome. Yeah, and the pleasure is mine as well. You do a wonderful job. And that's really where you and I are connected is in LinkedIn. So uh, you do a great job of really shining that light on grief. So good job to you as Thank well. You. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer. Uh, you know, it's interesting because um, sometimes I, I think about rock bottom experiences, right? And, you know, the most prominent one in my life was August 11, 2004. So we just hit 18 years ago. Uh, it was just a, a regular warm August day. And my family and I were going to go get school supplies for the kiddos. Hmm. And at the last minute, I decided not to go on that family errand. And so my youngest at the time was five and she was in the middle of the back seat of our car. And she said, mom, can I sit in the front? And so I put Miss Amber in the front on her booster seat. And as Brian got ready to leave, Brittany, one of my twin daughters said to me, one more hug, mom, one more kiss. Mm -hmm. And so I gave her a hug and a kiss. I kissed Brian on the forehead and they drove off. And 10 minutes later, a drunk driver blew through a stop sign and killed Brian and Brittany instantly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we talk about grief and we talk about rock bottom experiences and all of those kind of things, what's interesting for me is that I've actually had a couple other worse rock bottom experiences in the last 18 years. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's hard for people to comprehend because they think, how could anything be more tragic or rock bottom, Jennifer, than losing your husband and child? Mm. So what I try to share with people, and it's really why I wrote, you know, my first and second book was because I wanted people to understand that I had actually been in the psychiatric unit as a young mom, three mm. little girls, 24 years old, and by no fault of my own. I found myself battling suicidal ideation. Hmm. I was so driven, high functioning, graduated a year early from high school, had my cosmetology license, yeah. you know, had my own hair salon. And after the three kids, I mean, I can see it now that there was a, a, some postpartum depression, hmm. but there was other pieces that were happening. And so, um, I battled suicidal ideation for an entire year and was consumed with these thoughts that came intrusively into my mind and I couldn't figure out how to turn them off. And they basically just played on repeat saying, your kids are a burden. You, you know, you're letting them down. You can't do all the things that you used to do. You might as well just end it. And so I think it's important for people who hear my story to understand that I choose to see that rock bottom experience, the one that came before Brian and Brittany were killed, yeah. as this moment in my life that actually prepared me to know how to fight for myself and how to actually save my other two daughters on that day. Mm -hmm. And that takes a little bit of mind shift, but a little bit. I've never, I've never had a season in my life as dark as I did when I faced suicidal ideation. Yeah. And like, think about that, right? Like, okay, wait, how does that really make sense, Jennifer? Like you've lost a husband and a child and that season isn't dark, mm. but I want people to understand that with the suicide, 
my mind felt hijacked. Yeah. Whereas once I got that regulated and I was sleeping, we figured out I had a thyroid issue. So I started taking thyroid medication. Mm -hmm. We figured out that I didn't have any estrogen in my body at all. And as you know, I went on years later to have the Chiari brain decompression, right? The back of my head. So I have a titanium plate in the back of my head. And what they discovered when they were in there doing that brain surgery was that because my brain, the Chiari brain was squishing my pituitary gland. And so my whole life, I've had this issue with thyroid and estrogen, right? Yeah. Uh, by no fault of my own. Yeah. So at least when Brian and Brittany were killed, I had my mind. Mm. And that's, Such you know, you and I, you and I had that conversation just briefly before we hit go today. Right. And how you were basically saying like, you want to shine light on the fact that these things that we go through, they don't have to be the end, right? Yeah. That, that they don't have to be the end, but I want to make sure that people understand that when you're battling suicidal ideation, that's an entirely different beast mm. than grief itself because yeah. it's just all consuming and it's, it's so complex yeah. and grief, grief is complex too. Yeah. But I'm, I'm uh, so grateful that you point that out. I, I just really want to say thank you so much for sharing this uh, in such depth straight away. You know, we, we got straight into your story and I'm, I'm really grateful that you did. Uh, because the biggest thing for me here is uh, to look at the big picture, to look at everything. And so many people don't. And I believe the one thing that happens all the time in the space of grief is that people just look at that one incident. In your case, the crash that changed your entire life mm -hmm. and everything else around it, positive and negative, just gets completely neglected and forgotten. And I always say it is so important to look at the entire picture for help, for counselling, for finding a way through this, for uh, supporting your mindset in terms of, you know, how can you get through this? Because for me personally, there's no question that everybody can. The only question is, do you want to? That's the only question. Do you want yeah. to heal from this? Because if you want to, there is a way. And I know that sounds very simplified, but that's how simple it is. So I'm so grateful that you share that because I believe in our healing journey, it's the utmost important piece to look at the entire picture. Where do you mm -hmm. come from? Where do you get your strength from? Where do you get your tools from? And, and as you so nicely share, thank you so much. Um, you learned the hardest part in your darkest hour. And that that, in a very weird and bizarre way, prepared you to handle what was to come. It really did. I mean, and again, so, you know, one of the biggest things I learned in the psychiatric unit was what is a red flag? Mm. And they back then, so, I mean, we're talking like 20 something years ago, okay? Mm -hmm. But back then, um, they basically said, you know, have you ever been on an airplane and had a flight attendant tell you that in the event that you're flying with a child, that you should put that oxygen mask on who first? And you would actually be surprised how many times I've been in an audience and I've asked that question. And like some people actually say yourself. And so I'm just kind of quiet for a moment and I have to say, no, act, you know, like, or put it on your kid first, right? Like, mm -hmm. I have to kind of be quiet with the answers because wouldn't you agree that our first inclination as a mom, if you and I were flying, wouldn't our first inclination be to take that oxygen mask and put it on our kid first? I have to fully agree. And funny enough, right. I worked as a flight attendant and this was always one thing that puzzled me where I'm like, right. I would be the first one to put it on, on my kids first. And I had to learn this, really learn this to internalize the why yeah. on me first? And yeah, so they like they hammered that into us inside the psychiatric unit, which was like, you know, Jennifer, you have kids at home. And if you want to be good for them, you have to, you know, you have to get this internal fight for yourself One and you have to put this mask on yourself. I mean, again, we're talking, this is 20 something years ago. Okay. 24 years, I think now, yeah. but that's where I'm saying, like, I understood the things that they taught me, the red flags, the importance of having a team, your mindset, gratitude, reshaping, like all of these things. So, um, but when Brian and Brittany were killed, I mean, that didn't just happen in a week, but I can tell you the thing that I did do right away was 
because I knew that I needed to save them, I made sure that I got myself into support groups. Mm. Um, I chose a type of therapy. It's called EMDR. Oh, and cool. so I worked, you yes. know, I worked with my therapist because I had really horrific nightmares, yeah. flashbacks. I'd sit up on the edge of the bed and just yeah. scream. So, you know, it took me a good five years or so to really get to a point where I could even talk about it at all. Mm. Like I was mostly at the kids' school. I was cooking dinner. Yeah. Like, you know, there just wasn't, like, mm. there was not this lady that you see here. Yeah. It was very much just home front, get things done. Let's go to therapy. Let's do whatever. Yeah. But in 2009, so that's five years after, uh, someone asked me to share my story. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, my life changed. Wow. I saw for the first time the power in just a heartfelt, vulnerable sharing, how mm -hmm. powerful that was for the audience. And I, I felt sick. Like the day that I shared, I felt this very sick feeling in my stomach. I actually thought I was going to get sick in front of them. Mm -hmm. And you know that that's why I talk a lot about first responders, right? Mm -hmm. Is because that's when I finally started to realize that that's what they have to do. When they show up on a crash scene, they have to override their natural emotion of how they would feel. And they have to compartmentalize that and put it somewhere in order to accomplish a task. Yeah. And so that's why you see me talking so much to that niche is because mm -hmm. they do that day in and day out. They, and I can relate to that because I lost a twin daughter. Yeah. So every single day that I look out and see her and see her accomplishments, I am reminded constantly of what I lost. Yeah. Like there is no escaping. There, there's just no escaping the pain. So yeah. 2009, that's really when I started speaking. And um, it's neat because I, I, I love watching people grow in their speaking journey. Because something finally clicks. The, the speakers who make, make it and go for it, they finally realize that when you speak and you share something, it's not about you. Mm. Those speakers who finally hone in and say, when I speak, I'm going to put this speech together so that those who hear it take away something from it. Yeah. And that's that shift. So like, I would say it took me about a year or two. And I finally was like, I'm no, like, I'm no longer doing this speech in honor of Brian and Brittany. I'm no longer doing this speech because I want to share it. And it's healing for me. Like I'm doing this, I'm getting up here because I know who you are. Mm. And I know the problems that you're facing and you're in front of me. And so whether you realize it or not, I'm going to attack those problems for you. Yeah, And so that, that's really when that shifted for me into this is not the stage that I wished I would have started on, mm. right? Like, this is not the stage that I wished I had started on, Yeah, but it's the one I'm on. And therefore I've got something to say on this stage. So I, love that. I, I really love that because I feel that it's this whole this is where it actually, you know, you say it's not about uh, Brian and Brittany anymore. However, I feel this is the most beautiful love legacy that because of them, you are there to help others and to help others shift their perspective and to find that tiny little light through that tunnel, uh, just that beginning, you know, the first steps and the first responders. I, I love that you bring that in as well, because yes, um, they do need to compartmentalize. I, I want to share a very quick story here. I had a super beautiful experience after Rob died. Um, a couple of days later, the police woman who was first on the scene rang me and she said, I can only imagine that you must have hundreds of questions. Um, and I want to answer any, every single one of them. She rang me in her personal time uh, mm -hmm. because she said this was not a case like every other for me. She said so often we see people that die from heart attacks or uh, their likes who were overweight or old or sick or anything where it was obvious. She said, when I saw your husband, it got to me so deeply because he was fit. He was in a prime of his life. And I could see that this is not a typical case. 
So for her, it really shook her because she had three little kids similar age to mine. And I cannot thank her enough what that meant to me, that she took the time and made me feel that it was personal to her and not another case. That made such a huge difference. And she's in my group here now under a different name of, for obvious reasons. And I'm Thanks. so honored that she's here. And speaking about honored, I also want to say hi to Jeff Johnson, who's watching right now. So I'm, I'm yeah. really happy to have you here and Alan and a few others. Like, I, I just want to say hi to everyone and uh, bring it back to you, Jennifer. I, I love that you shared that message about sharing your message from stage to make a difference, because I truly believe that when things like that happen, that is up to us to find that purpose, to find that next step. It doesn't always have to be that huge purpose. And those, you know, right. not everybody has to end up on stage. When yeah. Oh, yeah. Happens. But I want everybody to find this next step, just this next step, a little bit further away from the pain, a little bit further into healing and with that being said, I'd like to ask you, Jennifer, can you maybe share a couple of those red flags that you mentioned before so people understand when they might be experiencing something like that? They go like, oh, oh, I didn't even see that at a red flag yet. Maybe I should look into something. Can you share a little bit about that? How? Yeah, uh, something, something I talk about that's pretty unique to me, like I've never really heard anyone break it down this way, but um, is what I call a tipping point. Mm -hmm. And so you know, how did this young mom, me, find myself on the very ledge of suicide going to do it? And, you know, it took me a while to really break down. How did I get there? Mm -hmm. So the tipping point is what I, um, I try to explain to people is like, someone finds some, something happens, they lose their job. And for them, whatever that is for them, it does like it never, we never have to compare. Like they never have to look and say, oh my gosh, my scale isn't as heavy or yeah. as full yeah. as Jennifer's was. So this shouldn't be a big deal. No, whatever it is for them, like maybe a lot of people this year have lost a job and now their scale is really high. Right. Yeah. But so what I talk about with the tipping point, it's just kind of that um, obvious scale. Right. Mm -hmm. So the hierarchy of needs, we've got them. But it's like, okay, let's say things on the home front aren't so good. And then let's say you lose your job. Mm. And then let's say now you're not sleeping well, right? And so all of a, right? So it's like all of a sudden the scale is very tipped. And oftentimes people say, what is that that makes someone make that final thing to end their life, right? What is that? What is that tipping point, that final thing? And so my job, whenever I'm working with people or for myself over the last 18 years, when I'm being honest and I look in the mirror, if I feel like my own scale is like getting here is to say, what do I have to do to bring that scale back down? So like, I never want to ever be up here, here, right? Because then even I, then even I feel like I'm putting myself into a situation that's mm -hmm. not good. Yeah. Like, um, one of the things I love about Jeff is he talks openly about how last December, you know, he yeah. found himself in just a really dark place. And I love that he shares that honestly, because again, he was going through things. He was, you know, doing this endeavor, like all of this stuff, right? Like all of these things that we can't really see behind the scene. That's like all of a sudden he finds himself on this ledge, right? And that's what I call that tipping point. And so good job for him for recognizing it and then taking action to make sure that that scale comes back. Wouldn't agree to with that. And, and that's, you know, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no. So like, that's what I kind of call the tipping point that uh, that's something that I've kind of used to help people say, like, evaluate for yourself. How are you doing financially? How are your relationships doing? How are you doing spiritually? How are you doing emotionally, mentally, and really being honest with yourself yeah. about that. Um, and then I think, you know, it seems so obvious to me, but you said this when you and I were talking. So right out of the gate in my book and chapter two, I have five things that I say we have absolutely no control over. Mm. And I really encourage people to memorize that like the back of your hand yeah. so that anytime one of those five things comes up, you're able to say, is this something I have the power to control? Yes or no. So the weather, I can't control the weather. Other people and their choices, I can't control it. The DNA that I'm born with, I cannot control that. Mm -hmm. The past, 
I cannot control that, That's right? So when you know these five things, which I didn't give you the fifth one, but if you know these five things, like the back of your hand, right? Mm. When something comes up against you, you can quickly say, wait a minute, I don't have any power to control this. Mm. And then you can quickly go back internal and say, but what do I have the power to control? What do I have the power in this situation to change or confront? And I utilize that so much that sometimes I forget that people don't really utilize that, yeah. that they don't stop they don't and say, about it. Yeah. right? Like they, they don't hone in on that and say, I can't control these five things yeah. ever. Death, death is the last one. Every one of us is going to die. Yeah. None of us is gets to change or control that, right? But yeah. in this moment, you and I are alive. And so we get to say, okay, but what am I going to do about that, right? Am I going to sit on the couch and eat bonbons the rest of my life? Yeah. Or am I going to get up and fight to be alive? Because I definitely want to be alive to see my, you know, I've, this year I got to see my girls get married, which. Oh, I wanted to get to that. I love that you say that. No, it is, I, oh, I mean, it, it is a pinch me. Mm. It is a pinch me year yeah to just be like somehow internally um you know Michaela is my oldest and it was her twin that we lost mm. and somehow she incorporated a little bit of her dad into the service into this you know the ceremony yeah. she asked my husband Jeremy to walk her down the aisle mm -hmm. and somehow after all of these years, after 18 years, I'm finally able to just feel like, <sighs> yeah, like they, might... they are happily married. I love the men they chose, you know, just, I, I don't want to say I made it because now I'm like embarking on shoot, <laughs> we're married. Like here comes them having babies. Like Right, oh, like you huge both, milestone and you made right, it. It's right. a big high five to the super Thank mom. You. Like, <laughs> it, it is like I finally, if all these years, I'm like, you know, there's almost a sneaky part of me too where I'm like, all right, those men that you pick, you're they're yours, you know, because yeah. like, you know, it's been me, like, yeah, carrying them, being there for them, refusing to give up on me or them through the seasons. Yeah. So to, for them to have partners now, it's like, yeah, you know, yes. like <laughs> your responsibility. <laughs> this thing, um, Michaela's husband, John, the day mm. of the wedding, his mom is Holly. Yeah. And when we were, it was kind of in these like final moments, we were just giddy. And I swear we hadn't been drinking. We were just really <laughs> excited. Nothing wrong with drinking. I'm just saying like, we weren't drinking, not yet, but, um, we were in our little like suite and everyone was getting ready. And her and I started going, oh my gosh. you know, we were like, we were like bitty silly. And I was like, I'm getting another son today. And she's like, I'm getting another daughter. And then she just turned and she looked at me and she literally took my arm and she said, and I'm gaining a sister. Oh, oh, you got to like that. <laughs> That's beautiful. Like, that that feeling of my daughter picking someone who is also looking at me and saying I like you Jennifer oh. right like we like you too we want to like that's why I'm saying that feeling of like you know finally so it's it's easy for me you know at this point to say to people, hang on, don't give up, right? Especially in their fresh on grief. And I do want to make sure to let you know that I have a free resource on my website. Yeah. And it's 10 ways that you can come alongside someone who's fresh into grief. Beautiful. Thank you. Because there really is a different way, I, I just want to quickly throw in here. Um, when we're done with the interview, as per usual, we'll be sharing all the links. Okay. Now you can get in touch with Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer also said, yeah, of course, I'll come into your group so I can answer any questions because I, yeah. I, I keep looking down because I keep seeing people commenting and, and saying things and I'll, I'll read them out in a minute. But it was just um, really beautiful to know that 
you'll have the opportunity to connect. You'll have the opportunity to get the link to the links, I should say, to Jennifer's books yeah. as well and, and the free resources. So thank you so much for that. I really appreciate that. Yep. Yeah, I, I have a quick look because I know that, che um, that Jeff, Boss, I, I need my glasses to read out those comments showing my age here. I have, keep pretending I, I have this too, but I refuse to put them on yet for this. <laughs> <laughs> so Jeff just said, oh, two of the best. Thank you. You are such a gentleman. Aww. Keep being undeterred, you too, Marie, Tra uh, Marie and Tracy. Yes. Uh, Samantha, uh, I lost my partner in a motorcycle accident seven years ago. This year I was diagnosed with PTSD as I watched her crash and pass i'm really struggling with all of it do you have any suggestions on where to begin to heal we're more than happy to get into that um maybe just uh i'm happy to say something uh, if you want to say something if you got any obviously you just mentioned you've got the the free resources that i would love for you samantha definitely to download yeah so there's and, two or three um, inside that free one yeah um there's one, and I, I make it very clear in there, but it says this one literally saved my life, but I'm happy to share it with you really quick. Basically, it is that because our grief journeys are so unique, we have to really stop assuming that people know what we need. Yeah. And I am a huge words person, okay? And so I realized pretty quickly that after Brian and Brittany were killed, that my love language was words. Mm. So- when my friends would say to me, Hey, Jen, I'm always here for you. Do you need anything? What can I do? I got really good at saying this to them. Mm -hmm. This might sound really silly to you, but when you think of me, will you call me? When you think of me, will you send me a card in the mail? And so that inside the free grief guide that I created, mm -hmm. the thing that I tell people is to be very specific. So for mm -hmm. instance, let's say your husband used to uh, mow the yard. Mm. when someone says, you know, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. You have to learn how to say, you know what, Tom, there is actually something you could do for me. Tom, would you be willing, please, just for three months to come over every other Friday and mow the yard? They'll just take that off my list. Right. And sometimes when we're in the grief, that can be really hard to ask, but people yeah. are dying. They want to help us. Like, you know, yeah. people come around us. They want to know, but we yeah. have to really sit with ourselves and say, what is it I need? Yeah. And that's that hardest thing, right? It's yeah. like, okay, well, what do you need? And again, yeah. as I shared, I knew I needed words. And anyone this year who has walked along with me, Jeff included, you as well, you see me out there saying, I need words today. Mm. I'm grieving my brother. Yeah. You know, right? Are y'all here with me? Yeah, I, I want to say something here because this is this is just so beautiful. I love that you picked that as an example because funny enough, I always bring uh, the other side of that same coin, which is be specific when you offer help. You know, when people often say, how can I help? I, I get messages on a weekly basis from friends who have lost someone or know somebody who's lost someone. Right. They always say, what do I do? What do I say? How do I support them? And I always say, be specific in what you offer, i.e., can I come and mow, mow your lawn? Can I come and cook for you? I've got either Tuesday or Wednesday next week where I can drop off meals. Can I come and just sit with you? You know, be specific in what you offer. And I love that you say the exact same thing from the other side. Be specific in what you ask for. Learn to ask for it. And that is so tricky because I'm not words of affirmation. It's, it's a, a lower one for me, but my highest one are quality time and physical touch. So I, I really miss that so much that quality time with Rob and that hugging and holding hands and and I always say that to people people know that I'm a hugger I need that right. give me hugs you exactly. know. So, so mine is quality time and words like they're very tied right yeah. Same for and me. so yeah. again back then so much of a hugger yeah. you know all of that mm -hmm. um but yeah but learning yourself like there really is no journey as painful but as rewarding as going inward during this process, yeah. no matter who you are. And no, again, like no amount of loss is too small, right? Like my heart's been very troubled for the people here in Florida who have lost their homes. Yeah. I would never look at them and say, oh, you know, you only lost your home. At least no one yeah. didn't pass away. Right. Like, no, right. Like that's the most traumatic thing for them. And right. So that's one thing that like always, sometimes I fear 
when I share with people all of the different things I've been through, sometimes I fear that they're just like, oh my gosh, how did she get through that much when I'm over here complaining about this little thing, right? And it's like, no, that's still your thing. Yeah. And for you, it's the biggest. And I always say comparison doesn't help you heal. You know, you yeah. need to focus yeah. on what you have. I, I just want to quickly highlight one more thing that you said, Jennifer, and in particular for Samantha watching here who asked that question, um, that uh, the reaching out for help that people are really so keen to do something for you. And you have to understand, even if that might be the last thing on your list right now to worry about, and I really understand why, um, that people are literally just as helpless as you. They feel completely helpless in that situation. They see you, they watch you suffer. They're your friends, your family. They love you dearly. They want to help you. So by allowing them in, it's such a double whammy. You know, you're helping them and you're helping yourself. You're allowing help in and it makes them feel better and it makes you feel better. We don't heal well in isolation. We need yeah, community. Yeah. We need community to understand us and to hold space for us and sometimes even to hold us physically. So I just yeah. wanted to highlight what you said. You know, we are doing other people a favor as well. And even that, that, even that might be the last thing on your list to think about how you can do other people a favor, but it does help you. You know, it does help you. It comes back to you. And, it's and I always really share with people, I, I put this in my book, but it's like, I tried reaching out and because there was a lot of complex details with the way our story was happening, mm -hmm. um, I was judged by several people. And so I always like to say, you know, if the people that you reach out to aren't kind and loving, or you feel like they are judgmental, because, you know, yeah. sometimes you, there are certain things that you need, right? And then you ask for them. And sometimes people dismiss it, or they'd say, why would you need that? Or like, I mean, some, they don't mean it. They're good hearted people, but sometimes people can hurt us in the process of us, uh, of us asking. Yeah. And so um, one of the things I like to encourage people is don't give up. Like, you have to, again, learn that inner fortitude and say, whatever about that person, right? Maybe that's their own problem. Maybe they've got their own whatever, but like, don't stop asking, right? Mm -hmm. And again, for myself, I didn't really feel like I found people until I was with police officers, firefighters, and veterans. I was like, no, these people get what it's like to override day in and day out. I mean, traumatic brain injury of a titanium plate in the back of my head. Like it was not until I found those people who are like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that I didn't, that I, that I just was like, you know, I don't yeah. have to explain these things to them. Mm. So, um, and those were my, right until, until I met like crude humor, crude humor is something that I use all the time. Yeah. Well, you put me into a sweet little kind loving group with women mm. and I pull out this this part, this part of me. And they're just like, you know, like <laughs> they don't know what to do with me. It's true. And so I felt judged yeah. and out of place. And so don't give up, yeah. you know, don't give up until you find those people. Yeah, I agree. Like, and, you know, finding, finding your support network that works for you, you'll, you'll yep. feel that instantly. And I want to add one more thing to what you just said, Geneva, there is this, um, I want to call it a myth, actually, or maybe maybe rather a misconception. I, I think that's a better word for it, where people often say that in adversity, you'll find who your true friends are. I have learned that in a different way, actually, to be honest, and I want to share this here quickly, because I felt that in adversity, we learn that people are dealing with grief differently. And everybody's got the right to grieve with that differently. And I have unfortunately also lost two of my absolute closest friends throughout the process of uh, losing Rob and it hurt me so deeply at first and then I needed to learn that they had a different way to grieve Rob and only because it didn't align with mine and only because they didn't understand how I was going through the process doesn't mean that they are a either judging me and b even if they do it doesn't mean that they are bad friends. It just means that they are going through it in a very different way. And that was a really huge learning for me. It was a very important learning because I realized that I started judging them for judging me. And then I thought, hold on, no, there is no judgment. There's just grief and everybody deals with it differently. 
And I dealt with it so differently and nobody expected that because I escaped into happiness. That right. was my first go-to. And right. only because I added so much lightness and joy and happiness to my life, I took the boys traveling around the world within right. you know, five months of Brock passing. And uh, nobody knew the, the whole backstory why that was already planned, but nobody knew about that. But I, right. you know, I wanted to do that with Rob and then he was gone. And I thought, okay, I can't do that for an entire year, but how can I do it with the boys? I knew we needed to get away. I knew mm -hmm. I didn't want to be here for the first milestones and confront ourselves with that. So I chose happiness. I chose joy. I chose traveling. People judged me for that. People didn't understand. Yep. Oh, I, even, However, even this today. This was my way. Yep. Of in that lightness, I could then cope with the heaviness. I, mm -hmm. I did the whole, you know, like I needed to create this for me because down here I would have sunk. And I knew that. And I was also a promise that Rob and I had made to each other that if something mm -hmm. was ever to happen, we take the boys and create the happiest life possible. And I knew that was my lighthouse. That was my only option. But, you know, you dealt with it very differently. I dealt with it very differently. What is important is that you find your way that helps mm -hmm. you. And that you find, and if you don't find it, create your support network that gets you and that holds space for you and that has got no judgment because the judgment is not helping anyone. So, yeah, I love that. And I mean, again, you're a light in that area because of two things you said. You know, first of all, it's like you had that permission from him. You knew that he would want you to be happy. And so you were able to grasp onto that. Mm -hmm. Whereas most of us, like that took me forever to reach yeah. because of Brittany. I mean, anytime I put my foot into like the whole river of joy and like I'm living life, like I felt like I was abandoning my child. Yeah. I don't know how to explain it to you, but I just, yeah. I could not, I could not fully jump in. Yeah. And I had to finally realize for me, just because of Brittany. And again, I try to give people this permission, mm. which is, you know, do you feel like you've been handed a life sentence of grief? And if so, I want to teach you how you can carry that with you through what you're doing mm. instead of allowing it to, to allow you to be stagnant. And again, we're not here to judge whether someone feels it's a life sentence of grief or not. Yeah. That's not, that's not up to us, but mm. I love what you said earlier when you and I were talking, which was even if you feel like that, that's heavy. Don't allow that to keep you stuck where you are, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you can find life. Yeah. You can grow and heal through it. Yeah. Um, and so, like you said, you know, you went on your trip and you felt like people judge you for that. Even today at 18 years, right? Can you imagine looking at me? I've lost husband, twin daughter, like all the things I've been through. I still have people who look at me and are just like, seriously, like moms who've lost children, they, they just look at me and they're like, there's something wrong with her <laughs> because their minds cannot fathom. Yeah. Their minds can just not fathom yeah. that, that, that life is possible. And I love what you say about that, which is like, you don't, I mean, I think they're kind of both true, which is like, you learn who your friends are. I have two very, very dear friends who refused to allow anything that was happening my poor choices, anything mm -hmm. at all for them to change or leave me through the fire. Like Micah and Jody are hands down. They both knew Brian. They have known me 20 plus years and they have never left my side. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you find out who your friends are. Yeah. I kind of get that. Right. But I love how you reshaped that, which is like, Okay, those ones who didn't go with you, Jennifer, through the fire, hey, maybe every time they saw your face, they thought of Brittany, or every time they saw your face, they thought of Brian, and they couldn't handle that. And so mm -hmm. how could we give them grace around that, right? So I, I love how it's the key word here, I believe. Yeah, I love how you reshaped that. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, grace is a really big one in that. And I think, you know, in particular, when you are going through your own healing journey, it takes a lot to get to that point. You know, it's nothing that comes like a flick the switch and the next morning you wake up and like, okay, and there's joy and there's grace and I'm, I'm fine. It's not like that at all. It's a huge, huge journey of healing and learning and allowing and 
walking through the depth of it as well you know and it's just um I, I really love that I just want to quickly get back to I, I saw Samantha posted one more comment here and I want to just make sure that we've got her here um I thought I was coping with her death okay leading up to this year however is now for some reason hitting me harder than ever I don't understand why that has happened I am not sure Samantha if it has something to do with the upcoming holidays as well that is often a contributing factor to a lot of people but you know I'm more than happy to um, have a chat with you thereafter as well and or or Jennifer you know we're, we're both here for you to hold space and see how we can support you in this and uh as as we said you know we we both got resource documents uh, documents to to get to to download uh please feel free to do that and maybe um I'm glad that you are in this group here so you are already so surrounded by love and support and yeah I think it's so important out. to speak to that which is like I just want her to hear like that's normal like you're not crazy that it's taking you this many years for all of a sudden for now yeah. this year for it to hit you as hard as it has. Yeah. Right. Like whatever your body has done up until now, it did to protect you. It did it for you to survive. Like any of those things that we have done. And for now, for it, one of those bravest things is when our, our body finally says like, it's like screaming at us. Right. It's like, you must deal with me now. And you're like, but it's right. Like, where is this coming from? Like, sometimes you can think about that. Hmm. It's really because your body is saying you're ready. You're yeah. ready to heal. You're ready to take this next step. So it's very normal. Hmm. One know? of the most beautiful gifts that I received once was a, a vision. Um, and I work really well with uh, visuals. I was um, a picture of a spiral. And they showed it in two perspectives, once from above where you just see the circle and you literally, when you look at that perspective, you feel like I'm going around in circles. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm here again. I'm here again. And then you look at it from the sideways perspective and you see that spiral and all of a sudden you realize, oh, all along I've been healing this and I'm getting further up and further up. And, and it feels like you're at the same point again, but you're actually not. You've already healed to the next level, to the next level. And only because you got to that level, you might be ready for another one now where mm -hmm down here you might have not been ready for that so sometimes it feels we're in the same space but when you look at it from a different perspective you realize how far you've come and how much you've healed and I'm thinking maybe that helps you as a perspective as well it helped me so much this is one of yeah. the reasons why this is called up spiral grief you know because I'm, I'm so glad I mean honestly when I so I have to tell you all of this time I thought it was unspiral grief like all of this time I've seen you and everything I thought it was unspiral which I just thought that meant like grief is complex and you help people like not make it so complex right yeah. but now that you've explained that like I love that perspective because it is it's like that onion right yeah but each time you know it's you know you're un up spiraling it so I, I love that I mean, yeah. there's a lot of ways, you know, to say that, like where you're getting closer to your highest self or shedding off ego or, you know, yeah. however people say that I'm, I'm kind of a person of faith. And so mm -hmm. to me, it's um, really embracing like, what are the qualities that mean something to me that I really get to take with me to the other side, yeah. you know, That's joy, so cool. compassion. Yeah forgiveness, yeah. humanity, acceptance, like all of these things are things to me that as I'm going up that and I'm shedding off, yeah. that's why I really loved that you, because I would be someone that probably would say, you know, I've learned who my true friends are, but not in a mean condescending way, but just as in like, they've stuck with me. Yeah. But I love how you reshaped that as in yeah oh. I needed I think I've needed to learn it for myself because I lost my absolute closest friend or at least I say now I lost her we are catching up next year to have a big talk about everything but right now I feel like I've lost her right. and I've known her since I was 12 and she was 13 you know so she's been in my life forever and she was there after Rob died but I felt that she saw where I was at in such a different light and I don't want to go into too much detail because it's very personal for me to, to deal with her about that but it is just that one thing that I needed to learn that for me that people deal with things differently and it doesn't make her a bad friend at all she's been the most amazing friend in my entire life mm -hmm. and that hasn't changed it's just that we are not as close at the moment and that's okay you know I right. needed to accept that I needed to step away and 
give her that space and that's fine with me but uh, I just wanted to put it out there for people to maybe have a different perspective rather than going straight into you know she's not my friend anymore I don't really see it as such right. with, yeah well and I mean the the only thing I really know how to relate that to um, which I think is so vital right now is that feeling is I have felt that way with my daughters yeah so because I lost the husband, I lost the child. Yeah. And there is this in this need inside of me to continue to especially talk about Brittany. Yeah. It's just very, very important to me that she not die, that I talk about her. Mm -hmm. But neither of my daughters need to talk about their sister. Like yeah. they do not feel the need to, they don't feel the need to honor them in special ways every single year mm -hmm. and so there was kind of this begrudging of me a little bit the last three or yeah. four years of like what do you mean you don't want to do this with me we've always done this every year and mm -hmm. you know there was this right like yeah it felt like they it was dishonor like they were dishonoring yeah their dad and their sister and I had to step into that place that you're saying which is like no for them they're different. actually okay it's okay for them to not have to do that anymore. Maybe and I have to, give, have to right. give them permission to do whatever feels right for them. But yeah. as the mom, it's like, you know, like, it's so hard to override. Like, what do you mean you're not going to honor your sister? Like, yeah. so, yeah. you know, that mama bear part, I've had to really learn how to jump into that space the last three, four or five years with my girls. And give them that space and say, no, they are going to learn to handle this their own way. And I have to come at this in a kind, loving way and say, that's okay. I really feel in my heart that I want to say something to you from mama bear to mama bear, if that's okay. Yeah. Because when you spoke about your other two girls, can we just name them, please? Because we always say your other two daughters. Can we please name them? Yeah. So oldest is Michaela, yeah. and then Amber is 24. Okay. And then Brittany was Michaela's twin. So it was yeah. Brittany, Michaela, and Amber. So what came to me when you spoke was that you have done such an incredible job in your healing journey and in being such a shining example for them, how to go through the depth of all of it to come out on the other end and find ways how to deal with it and how to allow joy back into your life that I feel that due to you, to your doing, to your being such a beautiful example for them, that this might be the exact reason why they don't feel that need anymore because they've come so far and they feel so much that they are okay with it. Yeah, it's, thank you. I mean, that's, that's a gift. Thank you for that. I, it doesn't feel that way, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but that's, that, like I said, it's the only thing I could relate to you in that feeling of loss of, you know, how someone we think they should show up for us or whatever, right? It's It's been my own children. And so learning how to separate that out and say, no, they, they don't need that part. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I still do. And so, you know, it's been important. So it's actually funny. Anybody, um, I don't know if Jeff's still listening or anybody who is kind of in my sphere who ends up watching this. Um, but what's interesting is inside of LinkedIn, it is my safe space. Mm. Like, you know, I'll pull out an old video of Michaela speaking and mm. I'll share it inside of LinkedIn. Like I have her blessing to share it, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'll talk about her and share it. Right. Yeah. Well, she's not in LinkedIn. Yeah. And I never do. There are so many things that I do inside of LinkedIn that I don't do inside Facebook. Yeah. Because both girls are inside Facebook and like, you know, I'll be talking about Brittany and honoring this and that. And then you'll see me over on Facebook and I'll be like, woohoo, Michaela's running, you know, Michaela's doing this today. And so yeah. it's, it's caused a little bit of like, for me of like, okay, wait a minute. If you're friends with me in Facebook and yeah. you follow me on LinkedIn, you might be like, like, was Just Jennifer in this photo? Like how that <laughs> happened today? And it's like, well, yeah. they're, they're two different worlds for me. And the yeah. Facebook world, I've had to learn how to honor. Yeah. 
what my girls want inside there. And they don't want the same way that I show up inside of LinkedIn. That's it's beautiful that you have both options, you know, and yeah. uh, I mean, we are not connected on Facebook yet. I'm not at will change after this interview today, but uh, I've been following you on LinkedIn for a long time. And, and your focus clearly is on helping people through this and catching people from where they're at, you know, understanding people. I really, truly have the feeling when I read your, your posts, uh, they really speak to my heart, you know, and, and it's really just beautiful how you talk about that and you, you share all of it, you know, the vulnerability and, and the solutions and the options and the healing and all of it. And it's raw and it's real. And I just love it, you know, so uh, kudos to you for doing that. And Thanks. I know we're like way past our time, but I couldn't tell us. I, I don't even know. I, I put my phone in air, airplane mode. So yeah, I don't even know how long you normally go or anything. That's, like I said, that's you know. Fine. Yeah, that's the one thing I didn't mention to you. And that's absolutely yeah. fine because I knew that yeah. we probably go uh, way past our normal time today. And that's fine because that's our final session. And everybody yeah. was really here to to listen to you. And before I do let you go, Jennifer, is there any last final words that you would like to share where you're like, if you get one thing away from this interview today, then I want you to take this home with you. Yes, I definitely. So I just always really like to encourage people, which is finding your solution the way through is as unique as your thumbprint. Okay. Like they can trace you and I across the country. Yeah by our thumbprint. That's how unique we are, right? Mm. And so we have to give ourselves that permission to heal and find our way through and allow it to be as unique as our thumbprint. Yeah. And so just really giving yourself that permission that, you know what, you tried this, that didn't work. You tried this, that didn't work. Keep trying eight other things until you find that thing that works for you or the things, right? And never give up. Like, like, that's, that's kind of my marching, you know, how am I this here 18 years? Yeah. Cause I, you know, I did like you, like you said, with your spiral, right. It's like, just kept going and going and going. And each round I was like, that, works, that doesn't, that does, that doesn't. And, you know, I, I use what works for me. Yeah. So. Thank you so much for being here. It was such an honor sharing space with you here today. I was so looking forward to yeah. having you. And I'm, I'm truly, truly honored that we are connected and that you shared a little bit of your story with us here today as well. For anybody, anybody listening to this, I know that there are a handful of people, at least for each and every one of you, that you know of that could deal with some hope and some love. And please do share these interviews far and wide. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. Uh, we'll be sharing this on LinkedIn everywhere. So the links will be shared far and wide anyway. Please feel free to do the same because in particular now in the lead up to Christmas, there are mm -hmm. so many people out there who do need some extra love, support and hope. Do feel free to reach out to them no matter on what side of that metal you're on, whether you are the one supporting or needing support, please be precise in what you need and what you can offer. I'm sending you so much love. Thank you so much for being here. This is Jennifer and Marie signing off. Bye, Bye guys. Thank so, you. so good to be here. Thank you so much. Bye.